Well, good evening, everyone. Grace and peace. Everybody, make sure to get a handout, and uh, everybody just come on in and have a seat. It is uh, really, really good uh, to be together tonight. I want you to think back to last Wednesday. Uh, Daniel and I had lunch together at Corumbas. If you've never been to Corumbas, you should go and get there. Uh, get you a lot of network. El Negro Jose enchiladas, they're amazing. So while we were eating our enchiladas, uh, Daniel and I, uh, we were just talking about uh, many things. Uh, but we were talking about our his time at uh, Asbury, then college, now Asbury University. Uh, we were talking about Hughes Auditorium. It's the building in the center of the campus. We were talking about East Stanley Jones. And... Um, E. Stanley Jones, a famous uh, missionary, um, kind of from about 1910, he died in 1973, talking about him, and uh, he was there uh, for the uh, first revival at Asbury uh, in 1905. And I go out to my car, and I open my phone, and there is a new revival that is happening at Asbury University. And that revival is still going on. It's had nonstop worship for over a week now. And uh, it has been remarkable uh, to read the accounts of what's going on ahead. Hopefully, we talked about it a little bit on Sunday. Just, just go and seek out information about the Asbury University revival. And just, just encourage you to read and read accounts of what's happening. And yeah, it's very encouraging. Very encouraging about the possibilities that this could bring to our nation, uh, to us. Uh, it's so cool that we have two uh, people from Asbury Theological Seminary coming to share. With it. This was planned a long time ago uh, to come share with us at the end of March. So please put that on your calendar. March 25th, that's a Saturday, out at the Way Retreat Center. March 25th, Way Retreat Center, 9 a.m. We're going to feed you breakfast, and then Old Testament professor, retired, uh, Dr. John Oswald is going to lead us through the back end of Isaiah. Uh, most likely, he is the preeminent Isaiah scholar in the world. And uh, But not only that, this guy's heart is huge, and his love for God is deep, and you will be encouraged. That evening, 6 o'clock, we're going to feed you again. So two of your meals are paid for on the 25th. We're going to feed you again. And Dr. Timothy Tennant, the president of the seminary, is going to uh, be sharing with us. Uh, maybe some of you have heard him speak at our church before. Uh, he is the guy who wrote the book that guided Pastor Kurt and I's preaching when we preached on the body uh, back in May and June. Uh, he, he uh, wrote the book that kind of guided our sermon prep, prep for that. He's going to be uh, teaching that evening after supper and then also preaching the next morning on the 26th at, worship, at our worship services. And they're going to be able to share firsthand with us what's going on uh, with this revival. And it's going to be really, really cool. It kind of spurred me to uh, East Stanley Jones. Um, Printed like or wrote like 20 devotional books, and uh, I went and pulled one off the shelf and I started to go through it. And um, I'm gonna read you. I think was that just to say, like Baptists know Billy Graham, Methodists ought to know E. Stanley Jones. So these these little books, they're just one page a day devotionals. Find one online, get it, read through it. They are solid, fantastic. We should know him and. Do what we can to make his yeah you know, known to the keep his generation. legacy. It, it's just he is the master of the one life. I mean, he really is. And I want you to hear this. This is to the introduction to. I think this is his most famous one. The way uh, there is only one sickness, and that is homesickness. Whether modern man knows it or not. 
That is his chief sickness. He is homesick. He knows that he has one foot in time and another in eternity, and he doesn't feel at home in either one. He is afraid of both. He is afraid because he can't put these two together and make them come out as sense. His sums don't add up. Something is basically wrong. What is it? He goes on to say, you can stand anything. If you are sure you are on the way, can you be sure? And he spells out the answer to that question in this book. Uh, if you haven't ever read anything by E. Stanley Jones, uh, I would encourage you, Daniel says, to pick it up uh, for sure. Anything else on revival, E. Stanley Jones, or anything like that? Daniel and Kara, that's where they went to college. Kurt and I went to seminary across the street. Ken Rowland, if you've met him, he also went to seminary there. Uh, so we've got a lot of what you receive from us is a result of the ministry of these places. So this means a lot uh, to us and what's happening. And bless us too. I will say, yeah, and East Stanley Jones, it ties directly in to what we're doing here. He was a lifetime missionary in India. And uh, <clears throat> during his years there, became friends with uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, he tells him, and maybe in that book, maybe one of his others, but he tells uh, a story of conversations with Gandhi in which Gandhi would regularly express his admiration for Jesus and particularly express his uh, respect and really intent to live by the Sermon on the Mount. And so Gandhi gave E. Stanley Jones advice to pass along to Christians, basically saying, you all need to take the Sermon on the Mount much more seriously than you do. If Christians will start living like Jesus taught you to live, the rest of the world will listen to you. Advice to Christians from the world's leading Hindu. Uh, but. Yeah, through a friendship with East Angeles. Well, tonight, things kind of creeped up on us, and so we're going to have to ask your forgiveness. This is our last night together. Uh, we've got Ash Wednesday service coming up. The week after that, we're going to use this time uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 uh, to train our hospitality teams. The next week after that, we're going to have a time of fellowship. The week after that is spring break. The week after that, we will start something new. And uh, we are going to, uh, if you were here with us back in the fall, how we walked with Jesus, uh, kind of through the different places that he went, we're going to go and anchor ourselves in Jerusalem during Holy Week for those three uh, Wednesdays. And it will culminate on April 5th in a special Seder meal. And you do not want to miss that. Um, so we are really looking forward to being together. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to uh, let us know that you're coming because we need to all be as prepared as we possibly can be. So tonight, uh, and you'll get more of this on Sunday morning as well, we're focusing in on you know, spiritual practices of Jesus, the things that Jesus did to keep his life lifted up to God. Um, Good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for us. Um, scripture played a huge role in Jesus' life. If you remember back to last week, and Jesus knew the Psalms. He prayed the Psalms. And um, we're going to continue in that vein, focusing in on both the uh, informational reading of Scripture and the formational or transformational uh, reading of Scripture. And I'm going to begin by praying this through uh, Psalm 1, Psalm 19, and Psalm 119. Now, if you know anything about those three psalms, uh, Psalm 1 is pretty short. Psalm 19 is eh, a little bit longer. Psalm 119, it is the longest psalm. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. So we're not going to read all that. Uh, but I'm just going to pray a section of it. And I just want you to kind of listen as we pray.
pray and just allow the main themes of these songs just to, to nourish your soul as we lift up our hearts to the Lord together. So let's pray. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, Enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, to keeping them there is great reward. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say it. Let's just keep rolling. Okay. All right. Well, like I said at the beginning, we're going to kind of, kind of talk about two different ways to keep the scriptures out in front of us in order for us to keep our lives lifted up to God. There's two ways you can read. They're both important. So hear that. Um, there's, there's some that might say, well, we're, we're far, we're far too, we pay far much more attention to the informational reading of Scripture, so we really need to shift all the way over here and allow Scripture to really form us. You get, no, you've you got to do them both. But what I, want you to, what I want to do here in the beginning is I want us to look a little bit closer at Psalm 1. Psalm 1, it introduces the whole Psalter. I just want you to notice something. That the first word of this 150 collection uh, book of Psalms, it's important. The word Asher, you may know anybody by the name of Asher, uh, that's where they get the word from. And it's the word for, it's one of the Hebrew words that's often translated blessed, or happy, or very well off. Any takers? Any takers for that? Yeah, of course. Now flip over to the very last, the very the very last words of Psalm 150. Flip over there, and when somebody gets there, tell me what the last three words are. Uh, I 
wonder if that's telling us something. Could it be that the whole Psalter is summed up like that? That the way to a blessed, happy, well-off life is for us to be so centered in God that we praise Him. So the, the passage is, it, it, there's so much of, of, of Psalm 1 that calls us back to the earliest chapters of the Bible. I was telling Daniel maybe a couple of weeks ago, I had I had uh, I've read Psalm one hundreds of times and I've never noticed before. Where is the tree? Hmm. I've never noticed before that it was by streams, plural. Not one stream. Has anybody ever seen a, a, a tree by more than one stream? Hmm. That's supposed to make you say, huh. There is a place where this could be, by the way. The Garden of Eden. How many streams flow from the Garden of Eden? Whatever Psalm 1 is doing, one of the things that it is doing, it is calling us back. What did E. Stanley Jones say? There's only one sentence. One sentence. Calling us back to the goodness of the garden. That's one of the ways that formational reading of Scripture can work. You can be reading the same Bible passage over and over and over again. And as you grow and mature and stay centered in God's Word, something new is always going to reveal itself. Now, that may you may say, well, that's just kind of this odd trivia thing. Well, I'm still trying to ask God, God, what are you trying to teach me by showing me that? Um, So, you know the psalm, it begins with talking about the wicked. Um, and I do think that that's also a reference back to the conversation that, that Adam and Eve had with the snake. And then it goes on to talk about um, those who delight in the law of the Lord. And that's kind of where we're headed tonight, is becoming people who become so desirous to grow and to be formed and shaped by the Word of God, that it will be a delight to them. That we approach Scripture not in a way of, well, it's long, it's hard, some parts are boring, but that we have this generous approach to Scripture. Whatever God is saying to us in Scripture, if we don't understand it, that's on us to say, God have mercy, and for us to seek out the uh, wisdom that God is trying to teach us in it. But it goes on to say, those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on His law day and night. Now this word for meditate is the word Hebrew word Hagah. I don't think that's necessarily important. But this is what's important. Is that word literally means to growl. Kind of like how a lion growls. When does a lion growl? I don't know, maybe when it's ready to pounce on its prey. Um, think what he's getting at here is the sounds a lion makes when it's eating its food. Well, I know some of the sounds I make when I eat food. <laughs> Especially Korean food. I have two Korean friends, and they have taught me many, many things about life, about God, about friendship, about generosity. They have taught me things about food and how to approach food. Uh, Koreans, they eat out of everybody's 
they, they just they just you just eat. Uh, you have a plate, but you just you're grabbing, and if you don't make noise when you're eating, they take offense to it. Right? So they have taught me. I eat these lettuce wraps, meat, kimchi, vegetables, and you, it kind of gets like this big. You wrap it all, all up, and the way you eat it is you stuff the whole thing in your mouth. <laughs> Elena refuses to do it, right? Because it's gross or whatever, but I do it uh, once a meal in honor of my friends. And when you do it, it takes some time. <laughs> I'm not making this up, Steve. That <laughs> last night at our dinner table, Kara made this great meal for Valentine's Day for us. And Mia, who hardly eats anything, she she was she would eat and she was woo, she was throwing her hands up. The food was so good. And uh, so then we got to talk about sounds people make to celebrate a good meal. And I said, if past, I've had the privilege of sharing so many meals, Steve and our. 15 years of friendship that uh, I said, if Pastor Steve was here, he would go. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting personal now. Right? That's it. But you see the point we're trying to make? All of us are here tonight. We have, a, we have some degree or another love and trust in the Scriptures. But this is, Scripture's view of itself is really, really high. That this is life. And it takes time to understand it. But that's the kind of desire and passion that we should have to know and love and trust and live God's Word. More precious than gold, than much pure gold. Yeah. I mean, man, we are in Midland. Why do people come to Midland? Make a lot of money. Right? Do we really believe that the scriptures are more valuable than any amount of money we can make? Right? That it's the, like, in the ancient world, there was no such thing as, as refined pure cane sugar. The best thing that they had was honey. They didn't have it very often. So just imagine you don't eat honey, you don't eat sweet things hardly ever. But when you do, holy cow! It's amazing. Maybe that's the key to allowing Scripture to shape you formationally is that we approach it with this wow, wonder and awe that it's the absolute most valuable thing that we can put our hands and our eyes on. I told you this before in Bible studies that we have been in together, but it bears repeating. Anytime we open the Bible, I mean, you could, you could memorize Psalm 1 pretty easy. And you can feel really, really good about yourself. But memorizing Psalm 1 is not the point. The point is allow your life to be shaped by Psalm 1. Daniel's going to be talking about the informational reading of Scripture. I'm talking about the formational reading, so don't take this wrong, Daniel. Information without transformation avail of not. One of my professors uh, named Bob Mulholland uh, he, he said it like this and we got to move, move along pretty quick here um, he said it like this said that the ultimate interpretation of scripture is incarnational and this is what he meant by it. he was an avid skier and uh, 
he, he would say, okay, so say you were learning to ski. So you go to the library and you check out every book on the shelf about ski. And you read and you digest every word. And you know everything there is to know about ski. Then you go out on the slope, put your skis on. Do you know how to ski? No. Well, you're going to fall on your rear, right? You can't actually ski. Now, does that put that person ahead of somebody that's never read a book on ski? Sure. But you can't ski until you actually ski. We can't know the truth of Scripture. Like, love your enemies and do good to them. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and we can say, oh man, that's cutting edge, Jesus. That's amazing. But you don't know the truth of that until you actually arrange your life to love your neighbor. And then, that you arrange your life over time, Dallas Willard says, to spontaneously love your neighbor. Dr. Mulholland also goes on to say that from his perspective, that this is what Scripture, this is the purpose of Scripture. And you're going to get more of this on Sunday, but do you all know and Kurt and I are trying to decide, is it an advantage or is it a disadvantage? We are so advantaged by our access to Scripture that for three quarters of Christian history, people could not pick up a book and read the Scriptures. But it's only been in the last quarter of Christian history that they've been able to do it. So does that put us in an advantage or disadvantage? Seems like it should advantage us. But he goes on to say that the nature of Scripture is this, that the Word became text. Listen to John 1, just kind of, uh, he's riffing off of John 1. Uh, the Word became text to provide a place of transforming encounter with God so that the Word might become flesh in us for the sake of the world. Just get your cameras out and take a picture of this. I'm serious. Uh, this is gold. It's not to get us to heaven when we die, uh, but this is the scripture becomes this place of a transforming encounter with God. So that God's word might become flesh in us for the sake of others or the sake of the world. One of uh, Dr. Mulholland's um, go-to people that he read and studied a lot is Thomas Burton. Uh, Daniel's actually quoted him in our class together. He was a Trappist monk that lived, uh, was that outside of Louisville? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Trappist. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Get it? Why well, do you have to move your finger from in front of your camera to take a picture? <laughs> All right. He says, it <laughs> just let this set in. Oh, my gosh. It is the very nature of the Bible to affront, perplex, and astonish the human mind. Hence, the reader who opens the Bible must be prepared for disorientation, confusion, incomprehension, and perhaps outrage. What if Mardell's put a quote of Thomas Merton here by their Bible display? Right? You ever thought about the Bible doing that in your life? Uh, you've read something that offended you. You've read something in Scripture that you could not understand. You read something in Scripture that at first you never intended to allow to become a part of your life. But over time, as you, with further humility and further trust, this disorientation, 
orientation move to a place of orienting us in the very heart of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I mean, we know John uh, 3, 16, right? How about, John, how about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? All scripture. One of the things I'm so proud of uh, about our church proud of Pastor the the uh, the emphasis that Pastor Kurt helps us to bring to the Old Testament, right? Uh, that all of Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching. Hey, we're good for that. Teach us the word. Rebuking? Correcting? Training? In righteousness. Again, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the journey that the scripture is to lead us on. To be transformed people. Remember all the way back to the garden. That Adam was placed in the garden to do two things. What were they? Avad and Shamar. To serve. To bring forth life. And to protect that life. The scripture. Because human beings rebel. Scripture's purpose is to restore us to that original calling. Which is that every good work. We're going to have a practice that we're going to engage in at the end of our time together tonight. It's going to give you a little bit more of a taste of what it means to move out of our mind when we read scripture and move into our heart. Go ahead. A um, couple things that um, the quote Steve just had up from Dr. Mulhall about the work becoming text. There's a, there's a really good workbook that he did that um, is the kind of thing you could easily do with a small group or something like that. Uh, it's called the way of scripture that he unpacks that statement and unpacks what Steve is describing here is uh, formational reading of scripture. So it's called, it's called the way of scripture. It's a little bit hard to find just because it doesn't have his name on the cover, even though he wrote it. But up, if you search for it on Amazon, you'll find it. Uh, Upper Room Books published it. The way of scripture is it's part of their companions in Christ uh, series. That's right. Uh, Steve, what would you say the word for meditate was? Haga. Haga. I'll give you a reason that matters. Is uh, So, as Steve just read us from Psalm 1, uh, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate, they haga, day and night. Psalm 2, a link between the two that we don't see in English. So Psalm 1 is a profile of an individual fully given over to God. Psalm 2 is a description of groups of people, nations, it says, or peoples, who are in rebellion against God and His Messiah. So the first verse of Psalm 2 says, why do the nations conspire and the peoples, haga, it's the same word, most English will say plot, peoples plot in vain. So Psalm 1, the person who is fully given over to God, hagaz, hagaz, <laughs> hagaz, uh, on God's law, day and night. Psalm 2, the people, the society, the nations, Haga in vain. In other words, in, in, another way of saying this is we all meditate on something. Our minds are all pondering something. And every human being has the choice of what to direct that Haga action toward, what to set it on, what to center it on. And Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are giving us a profile here of here's the picture of a man or a woman who hagaz on God's law day and night. And here's 
the picture of, of groups of people, nations, entire societies that just haga on emptiness. Um, so that, 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 that's what we're getting at and what we're describing both on the formational and the informational side. This is going to be a fire hose uh, yeah. experience tonight in that we take, in, in the series of retreats we do, uh, we take a full retreat on what we're trying to cover in 30 minutes with you here tonight. So, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to give you, uh, let me try to just give you, as Steve said, a taste of the different things here. So, um, Eugene Peterson, some of you likely know him uh, mostly by, he was the one who translated the Bible into uh, the message. Um, he has a, a quote uh, that has stuck with me for a long time. He says, an, an enormous amount of damage has been done in the name of Christian living by bad Bible reading. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you read the Bible, you can see that it's not a lack of knowledge of the Bible. I mean, it is telling us we need to know it. We need to meditate on it uh, day and night. But then um, in the Gospels, the people who uh, go after and eventually execute the living Word of God, they knew their Bibles a lot more, you know, multiple times as well as any of us uh, do. So there, there's this interplay between knowledge is required, but knowledge is not the ultimate, uh, ultimate, ultimate point. And so Peterson's point, an enormous amount of damage has been done in the name of Christian living by bad Bible reading. Um, I may not end up getting to other stuff I have on there, because let me give you, let me give you a story. You, you, you can leave that up. I'm going to tell an illustration of this. Well, no, no, no. Let's go ahead to uh, the shortcuts. So, Scott McKnight has a great book. Scott McKnight's a New Testament scholar. Uh, great book called The Blue Parakeet. It's, my, it's probably my favorite book about how to, how to read the Bible. And so he identifies, in one of his chapters, he identifies what he calls these shortcuts. He says, you know, we, we go to the Bible and we want an answer. We want, we want to be able to do what the Bible tells us to do, So, but, but we want to shortcut the long process of development and maturity that the Bible has given to us to be a magnificent gift in aiding us in that process. But, but obviously, we want, we want the shortcuts instead. So he identifies a few of them. I'll just give a brief, brief description, then I'll tell a story that illustrates one. So one, he says, is morsels of law. And this is kind of illustrated by, y'all remember they used to be a lot more popular, say, 20 or 30 years ago than they are now. The bumper stickers that would say, God believes it, uh, what does it say? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. So sort of this sense that it's in the Bible, that's, that's, that's what we're going to do, by golly. And you, it, I'd say it comes from, it can come from good intentions, but the only way you can be consistent with that is not to have much idea of what, of what the Bible says. That because, uh, you know, Anybody in here who's, woke, who's wearing a piece of clothing made of more than one kind of material, you are going directly against what the Bible says to do. You know, we can pull out example after example like that, or even in the New Testament, uh, as Steve, as I mentioned, you know, sort of tongue-in-cheek a few weeks ago, that uh, we could make plaques out of Jesus' statement that if you're going to throw a dinner party, do not invite your relatives. I mean, Jesus says it plainly and clearly in the Bible. Um, so, but but we do want to we want to turn all of the Bible. This shortcut is an attempt to turn all the Bible into a law that okay, it's in print, so this is what I must do. That takes all responsibility of discernment and wisdom out of our hands, and we're just turning it over to ink. Um, so that's one shortcut. I'm going to fly through these as fast as possible to leave space for my story. So uh, another shortcut he calls blessings and promises. Y'all will be familiar with these. You know, you can go into the Christian bookstore. You can find the, the little tear-off calendar of, of 365 Bible verses for the year. Every one of them is going to have a, it's going to have a feel-good message to it. You know, there, you cannot find the 365 uh, tear-off of Bible verse day of, of the calendar of the verse draft. Uh, but they're in the Bible too, you know, so... This uh, morsels of blessings and promises, it's just let me look for the feel-good, flowery things all through the Bible, and, uh, and that's what we hang on to. 
uh, mirrors and ink blots. Kind of this idea that you, you know, like the what do you call it, the, the Rorschach test, that ink blot test. That basically a psychologist would, would put it up and ask you what you see. And it's not really about the ink blot. It's about you stating what you see because it's this idea that we all see what we're looking for. And so um, you get this is not difficult to conceive of. Can characterize it in terms of different groups of churches. We might say, um, even in the book of Acts, say the Charismatics are going to read it and they're going to notice the miracles and the speaking in tongues. The Baptists are going to read it, they're going to notice all the conversions and adult baptisms. And the, you know, uh, you could go on and on. And then the unfortunate generalization of Methodists is we don't read it enough to know anything about, uh, about, about it one way or the other. And then, um, Puzzle pieces. You'll see this a lot, particularly with uh, with like end time stuff of of this sense that that uh, the Bible is given to us as this big code that we have to unlock, and and you got this piece here and this piece here, and and all these uh, prophecies about stuff that's happening right now in the Middle East, and this represents this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And this. Uh, that is this kind of shortcut. And then the last one he identifies, he calls maestros, and that's the, that's the tendency to interpret all of the Bible through one of the Bible's voices. So um, uh, it, it, this happens a lot with, with Paul, that people will interpret the entire, and not just Paul, but they, they'll interpret the entire Bible through uh, a few verses from the book of Romans. You know, that, 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 bec that Paul becomes their maestro, and that becomes the lens through which uh, to interpret everything else in the Bible. Um, let me give you a story here of one of these. I think this would be an example of the morsels of blessings and promises shortcut. Uh, as y'all were walking in tonight, I played a song that I don't expect, I, you know, I, I told Dwayne, we don't need to have it cranked up, don't need anybody really paying attention to it. But I played a song that was on a, uh, it was on an app, it was, it's old enough that, uh, it was on a CD I had that, um, it was, it was kind of like I mentioned with the corner room. They took different passages of scripture and, and turned them into songs. And, uh, and so I had this album. I liked it a lot. I still listen to some of the songs on it. But how this one song made it on there uh, is an example of how prevalent this shortcut is. So uh, there, there's a song. And then part B of my story is um, a, long, a couple decades ago, I was at a, a men's ministry meeting, and this a, a young guy who had just become a Christian in uh, in about a year before that or less, he's standing up and giving his testimony. Very sincere guy, and he stands up and he starts reading uh, the same verses as that are in the song that I was playing when he walked in. He read. that you are experiencing, the worries that you have, uh, they are going to, they'll, they'll pass by and they will, uh, the, the line is that you will, that they will be to you as water's gone by. So these anxieties that you have, the troubles that you have, uh, they will just be to you as, as if water has gone under the bridge and you won't even remember them. So I was listening to this young guy uh, read these read these verses, and uh, I already had that album, and so the, the songs kind of in my head. But then I thought, wait a minute, I had just happened to in the week prior to listening to this guy, I had been reading in the Book of Job, and so so I recognized the verses, and I thought, we're not supposed to be saying them that way because the in the Book of Job, I mean, it sounds nice, right? That that your troubles. They're going to become as nothing to you that uh, they'll be like the water's gone by. Um, the problem is, I recognize that it's from the book of Job, and it's from one of Job's friend's speeches to Job in the book of Job. Which means 
those speeches are meant to be some, they're meant to be, they sound pretty good, but there's something off about every one of them. And so a little, just a little, a couple of verses earlier than what the song is quoting and what uh, that young guy was quoting, uh, Job's friend is blaming him for his suffering. He's saying, you're suffering this way because you're sinful. God is expressing his wrath on you, so put away your sin, and then your troubles will be gone. They'll be to you as water's gone by. So how in the world, this again, this was not back in the days of independent music artists being able to put their stuff out on iTunes. That had to get through uh, producers and executives at one of the big Christian music publishing companies uh, and make it onto this CD uh, with other songs from Scripture. So, back to Peterson's point of an enormous amount of damage has been done in the name of Christian living by bad Bible reading. If you were to uh, write those verses out to someone, give them to, to them, as, as a, you're intending to comfort them in their suffering, right? But then if they go look it up, uh, they're either going to say, oh, bless their heart, they don't really know their Bibles and know what they just gave to me, or... Or if they don't, if they don't know that what Job's friends' speeches are supposed to be, they could they could receive the exact bad message that the Bible itself is trying to counter in what in what we have given to them, right? Um, so the shortcuts don't do us good. The Bible is meant for a lifetime of swimming in it. Uh, of absorbing it, of being that one who meditates day and night because it is meant to be that place of transforming encounter with God that uh, there I, I know of nothing in the world more valuable for bringing me to maturity and wisdom over months, years, decades than setting my mind on this that I, again, back to Psalm 1 and 2, I have a choice and you have a choice about what I'm going to be pondering through the day. Um, and our access to this is, as Steve said, unprecedented, unprecedented in history. And, uh, and so for us to be intent on not being among those peoples, nations who meditate in vain, but let us uh, meditate uh, on what will produce good fruit in us over time. Um, the antithesis to those shortcuts, uh, what Scott, Mc Scott McKnight says in the Blue Parakeet and what uh, I think is the right way of looking at it is to read the Bible as a story. Uh, you can just put that up there real fast. I'm not, I'm not really going to go into unpacking this other, other than to put that up just long enough to say it is a story that we've got Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4, Act 5, Act 6 and there's a world of difference in reading it as a story because then I can, I can read things that are part of the story, and that's inherently a diff I'm going to read and listen to them in very attentive ways, but it's a different attention than if it's the morsels of law, right? Or if it's the morsels of blessings and promises. I, I, I'm, part of what I'm going to ask is, how does this fit uh, into the story? And ultimately, how does my wife fit into this story? Um, uh, Steve is more responsible for it than anyone and through Steve, Dr. Mulholland's stuff of bringing me into a, a deep, deep uh, love for the book of Revelation. And I would say when we learn to read it well, there's no other book in the Bible that, other than maybe Genesis 1-3, that, that describes the story that we are living in as fully and as comprehensively uh, and as meaningfully as the book of Revelation does. But it takes, it, it takes work, it takes effort to learn 
uh, to read it that way, and that's a that's a different. We can't take the shortcuts. The shortcuts are, uh, especially in Revelation, are they're going to lead us who knows uh, where and into some strange territory. Yeah, um, just real quick to Daniel's point. <laughs> whenever you think of the Book of Revelation, what's the most likely the most, the first emotion you feel? Everybody says fear. That's the exact opposite purpose of the book. What is Jesus, son of Jesus' very first words in the book of Revelation? Do not be afraid. <laughs> you see what we do? Because we, we take these shortcuts and we don't do this lifetime of work of meditating on God's word day and night. Reading Revelation well will lead us to, again, a, a lifetime of being able to look at the world around us, including the uh, difficulties, both that we face and the world faces, uh, and always ask, in light of this, what do we do? And the answer is always, follow the Lamb, follow the Lamb, follow the Lamb. Um, and that's such a different picture than waiting for Jesus to come back as if he's Clint Eastwood and blowing all his enemies away. And, you know, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so rather than trying to unpack this more, let me point you to uh, the Bible Project. They, they are, they're masters at helping us read the Bible in this way. Read it as a story. So Anytime you want to dig into another book of the Bible, go look up the Bible Project video on that book. And they, they will unpack how this particular book is part of the story. But what uh, maybe my favorite videos they have, there's a series called How to Read the Bible. So good. And the first couple of videos in that series, they just deal with this question of what is the Bible? I mean, we, we sort of take that for granted. Uh, but like those shortcuts or examples too, we, we, if we come to it with the wrong assumptions about what it is, we're going we're gonna to read it in different ways. Uh, there's, there's one of those points uh, where Jesus is having a contentious uh, back and forth with the, with the Pharisees and, uh, and he says, uh, they, I forget which, if it's, if it's when they ask him the greatest commandment, but Jesus' response to them is, how do you read it? He says, how, his question back to them, as a rabbi, how do you read it? And that, that's the question that we have to deal with, and inherent in that question is, is what is this that, that we are reading? So those, those, that series of videos from the Bible Project, how to read the Bible, especially the first uh, two or three videos in that series. They're, they're, they're fantastic and uh, can go a long, long way to helping us use this gift in, in, in the ways that it is uh, meant to be used. Um, I want to give you a tool as we head into Lent, that I have found to be the most helpful way, just for my own sake, of uh, combining these two, what, what we're talking about as formational reading, or we could describe that as reading with the heart, and informational reading, or we could say reading with the mind. That, that let's, let's take this uh, and read it well. And so, as in the exercise Steve's just about to lead us through, a characteristic of formational reading is that it's not about getting from beginning to end as quickly as possible. Um, those of you who have been in the church a while, you may remember a number of years ago we did a uh, Bible uh, through the Bible in 90 days. Yeah. And uh, that would be the epitome of like extreme informational reading, right? You're starting at the beginning, you're getting at the end, you're get to the end, you're trying to cover as much ground as possible, and you don't want to pause along the way. Um, so, this very linear approach. Uh, a characteristic of formational reading is sort of opposite of that. If I'm okay circling around this one 
passage, that Psalm 1 picture again of, I'm going to meditate on this day and night. Day and night, I'm going to uh, let it be what I am pondering. So a, a way that I have found really, really helpful over the years to combine these two is to take uh, the lectionary passages uh, for a given week and to read them repeatedly. So I've uh, charted them out here for all of all of Lent, which begins next Wednesday with Ash Wednesday and then up till uh, the eve of Easter Sunday. And so uh, the idea here is that we just take, I'm, I'm going to read these four passages repeatedly during the week. I, I think on that formational reading side of things, we undervalue repetition. Let me, let me read it, let me return to it, let me return to it, let me return to it, and as I do, I'm going to notice uh, different things or things are going to strike me differently. So that, that's the gist of the idea here. It's nothing particularly fancy. But then uh, on the informational side, you may see that, well, a lot of these readings are grouped together. We get some Genesis, early in Genesis, or particularly uh, around the middle chapters of John. And so you just read some bigger chunks. Say once a week, I'm going to read, uh, a lot of these come from John 11 uh, through the end. I'm, okay, that's half of John. Let me read through half of John. Get those, get those bigger chunks so you get the bigger picture and you don't make the mistake of quoting something that's from one of Job's friends who uh, is not meant to be a positive example uh, for us. And, by the way, too, th these are exactly the readings that we use every week in Vespers. And so if you've been reading them repeatedly uh, through the week and then you come to Vespers on Wednesday, you'll hear them again. And that, for me, is so meaningful because this is not only about me reading them on my own, but I hear them and listen them listen to them differently when I do so in a group, when I hear somebody else reading them aloud, etc. Again, uh, we mentioned it on the first week that this is not about just my practices. This is about us growing into the body of Christ together. Well, we're trying to push really hard tonight. We apologize, but I do want to introduce you to uh, another way to read the scriptures. Uh, it's definitely on the formational side. Um, maybe you've heard of it before, but it's called Lectio Divina. Um, is that word new to anyone? Go ahead. Is it new? Okay, thank you. It's okay. It, it's Latin uh, for divine reading. All right? Yeah. So, normally, Lectio Divina consists of taking a passage of scripture six to eight verses long. And uh, whether it's in a group like this or you know, all by yourself, and you're going to read that passage three times. The first time, you are looking for a word or phrase. So you're, you're allowing the Spirit of God to be the one that sets the agenda for your reading. When you read it through that first time, what word or phrase do you feel like God is lifting up, is wanting you to pay attention to? The second is, the second time you read through, as you're meditating on it, how is your life right now being touched by that word? Okay? So, what sticks out to you, and how is, how is it being touched? Third, what is my response to God? Basically, how are you going to allow that word to transform? So what we're going to do is we've got a really short song, and I know we're we're out of time, but we'll go ahead and, and we'll read through this. What word sticks out to you? What word or phrase? This is Psalm one thirty one. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, 
Put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. So as you listen again, just that phrase that stuck out to you, that word or phrase, just ask God, God, how is my life being touched by that tonight? My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. We read it for a third time. Just consider how you and God are going to work together to be transformed by this word. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have called and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. It's been a delight to share these times with you. And you're welcome. We will, we will keep you posted on what is next. And thank you very much. Good night.